I felt disappointed when ATSIC was wound up. The Minister was supportive. ATSIC had its problems, but they were fixable. I felt a sense of relief and at the same time sadness. A lot had gone wrong with ATSIC and the structure had ignored what the Tasmanian Aboriginal community had proposed from the start. My sadness was also for those community people who had tried to make it work by standing for election or working in the ATSIC office. An awful lot of blood, sweat and tears went into those years. They should have listened to us from the start. I had mixed emotions when ATSIC closed, in spite of all the bad press it had received over the years. For a number of people in my generation, ATSIC presented the opportunity for advancement through the designation of Indigenous Identified Jobs and the Public Service Graduate Program. I believe ATSIC was responsible for creating an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander middle class of Australia, the black middle class. It helped build a critical mass of skilled administrators, managers and directors who were able to influence economic, social and political change within their own families and larger communities. As a Torres Strait Islander, I was concerned as a community member and former ATSIC regional councillor that Torres Strait Islanders no longer had a voice on the mainland to represent their interest at a local, state, national and international level. It was never the intention of the ATSIC review panel to close ATSIC. It took me by surprise, reading about the abolition in the newspaper, in fact. The panel strove to do justice to the good work ATSIC had done, particularly in the regions, while at the same time acknowledging there were bad press around some major leadership issues at the time. I felt it was a gross attack on the potential of self-sustainability, growth and empowerment of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It was a gross waste of taxpayers' money to invest in something that had a democratic mechanism to allow Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to prosper, only to have it taken away after all its trials and tribulations. It should not have been shut down, but instead reworked so that any misappropriation or mismanagement was transparent and accounted for with the full wrath of the law. I was sad and disheartened to see the end of true self-determination for Aboriginal people. I actually left the Australian Public Service because I could not support the government's actions. ATSIC was a national family of passionate, talented and committed staff who worked with a sense of purpose for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I felt it was tragic when ATSIC closed. The structure of ATSIC was reflective of the diversity of Indigenous peoples. It was a powerful model. It had a democratic representative structure and was a well-resourced voice. Ultimately, I believe our own success, nationally and internationally, was to lead to our downfall. It was painted that it had failed, but in fact it was successful. If we had a fault, it was that we were too good. I believe that ATSIC was set up to fail. ATSIC had an administrative arm which basically was run by the government and an elected arm, and there was no way we could come together. Before ATSIC, we had the National Aboriginal Congress to give advice, which was an independent body, until government closed it down. This must be put in terms of the background of what was happening at the time. It was an era of significant tension between the Howard government and Indigenous communities. There were levels of unacceptable practice and behaviour, and there needed to be greater accountability. There was a paradox. Firstly, at the regional level, ATSIC was gaining legitimacy in terms of the representation, yet at the national level, there was a disconnection. Overall, there were mixed feelings in the community, but a clear view that the effectiveness of ATSIC as a national representative body was still highly questionable. ATSIC has always been a mixed and confused beast as an institution. It was an artificial external construct and was always going to have its legitimacy questioned in regard to an Aboriginal mandate. I felt it was unfortunate, even though ATSIC had many good people in it, the few that had control of policy and funding were not always acting in the best interest of all Aboriginal people. In the past, I had always wanted a representative body to take on the issues of Aboriginal affairs at the highest level of government. We obviously had to learn the hard way. ATSIC didn't deliver. It gave opportunities to too many bullies and crooks. 
It allowed political thuggery to go on. It didn't worry me at all when it closed. ATSIC needed to be closed. It was out of control. I thought it was a move ahead. When you went to the George Street office, the only dark you saw was the lass at reception. But there was a nice smell of leather. I felt that ATSIC had run its race. It had become a powerful body that did not deliver positive outcomes for a broad cross-section of Aboriginal people. It was unfortunate that those who managed to get themselves elected in the ATSIC process generally came from large families, whereby the force of numbers got some people over the line. Although at the time I felt that ATSIC needed to go, I also felt that the one recognised voice of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples had been gagged. I think there should be a representative body, but not to deliver services. There's a problem with the dual role of advocacy and service provision, as one role detracts from the other. There's a danger for a political body that they'll get blamed for the shortcomings in government. I still feel the same way as I did 20 years ago. It's important to have national representation so that we can negotiate with the federal government, but it should be valid and authentic not something constructed by the federal government. We've had enough of that over the last 200 years. A First Nations Council should come together. That's what's important. Our communities already know who should attend on our behalf. Our local and regional organisations already deliver lots of services. These should continue. A national body should be for other business, strategy, policy and negotiation of treaties, rights and agreements. I agree with the need for an Indigenous representative body where Indigenous Australians from all walks of life can have their say. I am a member of the National Indigenous Congress, the recently formed representative body for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I don't agree with the idea of this representative body needing to provide services for Indigenous communities. This is a responsibility of local, state and federal governments which needs to be addressed. Previous governments shifted their obligation for service delivery onto ATSIC and then blamed them for getting it wrong. I agree there should be an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander representative body elected by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. If such a body was to exist today, it should first and foremost be the voice of the people and monitor all levels of governments that are providing services to our people. There is a dire need for the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples to once again take centre stage and act as a voice for our people. In so doing, it should not be a service delivery type operation, but one that fully has the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's wishes and aspirations at heart. I feel that we do need Indigenous representation. Congress seems to be the new voice and has the potential to make a difference. It should be able to assist in the proper effective management and provision of services to Indigenous communities, respecting the diversity that makes up the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. Yes, we need a national representative body that has legislative clout and can keep all levels of government and bureaucracies highly accountable and fully transparent. We need a national representative body that ensures proper consultation with Indigenous people. I do think there is a need for an Indigenous self-determining voice, and I think the representative nature of it would have to be similar to ATSIC so everyone had a voice. No, I don't think it should provide services. Services to Indigenous people should be delivered by government. Advocacy should be independent from government. It shouldn't be confused by a representative body that delivers welfare. That's why I think having a treaty could be the process by which we run our own affairs. Yes, there should be a representative body, but it ought not to provide services. Government has responsibility to provide services to all Australian citizens. The new National Congress of Australia's First Peoples is now the voice of the people and it's their job to keep government accountable for service provision for all its people. There's always going to be a need for a representative body. 
but the nature of social, political and economic dynamics require that body to be an entirely independent and Aboriginal constructed body. The founding basis of such a body should be that it's negotiated with government. Based on settlement of historic grievances, it's independently resourced and not a construct by government. That can only be achieved by building the foundations at a local and regional level. The opportunity is available today in terms of formal recognition of native title, in terms of appropriate tenure in land ownership and the need to sustain cultural and customary practices and obligations dictated by Aboriginal law. I feel that the only way to achieve a truly representative body is for one to grow from the ground up. It should be one where people volunteer their time and expertise and represent all Aboriginals from the grassroots up. Having a body that is funded by government will produce an organisation with vested interests, one that can't advise without fear or favour. I was one of those who strongly advocated for the establishment of a government body. However, since at six demise, I'm convinced that Aboriginal people will be better off in the long term to have provision of services integrated into the mainstream federal services. Representative bodies only work when they are regionally based. They need to be accessible to people on the ground and they need to be able to listen to people at the grassroots. Otherwise, they are not worth having. The creation of a national Indigenous elite has made things worse for my people. The controversy going on now with the National Congress illustrates my point. The public announcements made so far go directly against my people's interest. The people from remote communities need their own voice, and that can only be done regionally. Now they've got the land, they want to take our culture, take everything away from blackfellas. I don't care about who delivers programs, whether they're black or white, so long as they're honest and know the rules well and what people are entitled to. Whilst I believe that there should be an Indigenous representative body, I'm not sure about the process for selecting such a group, particularly considering my earlier views about the election process. And in terms of the provision of services, I think that, in consultation with the community, government departments must remain in service delivery. I feel strongly that, in terms of service delivery, all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities must have a fair and equitable opportunity to access services.